If you know anything about the life of Dr. Kissinger, you can pick out all sorts of interesting elements from his life which express the person that I think he is. As a young uh, soldier with the 84th Division, he was bombarded in the mud in front of the Siegfried Line in 1944. Uh, when he moved to divisional headquarters in the 84th Division. It was a three, 335th Infantry Regiment. And the 84th was holding a line between Namur and Bastogne in the Battle of the Bulge. And then when they, they got moving again and got through the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge and the Siegfried Line and this gallop into Germany, he was personally one of the first American soldiers to walk into the Arlem concentration camp. And he saw, this just north of Hanover, and he saw the sites of the Arlem camp, and he wrote very movingly about it. And then if you go forward about 30 years, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in bringing the Vietnam War to a close. Of course, anyone who's been at the center of politics as much as Dr. Kissinger has, attracts criticism. It's controversial. It goes with the territory. Of course, he, of course that does. His, his Peace Prize in 73 was controversial at the time. But I would say to anyone who thinks about Dr. Kissinger's career, you only have to know a little bit about this man. You only have to pick out vignettes of his life to realize that when it comes to war and peace, nobody can say he does not understand it intimately from the inside. He has been in war and peace in ways that most of us are not called to do. He has experienced things that most of us have not done. I said to him before, and he said he wouldn't be offended if I said it, that <laughs> there's a line at the end of King Lear which is that we that are left will not live so long nor see so much. And I said, I wouldn't use it because it makes you sound like King Lear. But he said, I don't mind if you do. So there it is. We that are left will not live so long nor see so much. But for a, a great geopolitical thinker, a man of, of infinite wisdom on strategic matters, one of the things that has been said about him by, I think, Robbie Millen in The Times seems to me to get the essence of it, that for one of the great strategic thinkers of our age, he is actually an idealist with freedom at the center of his world view. And for that reason, Dr. Kissinger, you are very welcome here, particularly at this conference. Dr. Kissinger. <laughs> I, I hear it said quite often that uh, few people need an introduction less than I do, but even fewer people enjoy an introduction more <laughs> th than I do. And I appreciate what you said. It leaves me in a position in once I introduced Lord Carrington very, what I thought very eloquently, and he began his remarks by saying, I can hardly, after this introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. So uh, let me begin with a few observations about Lady Thatcher. I met her in the early 1970s when she was Secretary of Education. And uh, through my wife, who was doing research on education, uh, and urged uh, that I meet Lady Thatcher. It took a little doing because the Prime Minister did not see the absolute necessity of a security advisor meeting with the Minister of Education. But it uh, we, we met and it started a friendship which lasted till she left us. And we met several times a year during that uh, period. She set the tone in our first conversation in which she pointed out to me for that for her, political contests were not about adjusting views to the views of the center, 
but trying to get the center to adjust to her views. And she was only Minister of Education then. <laughs> Another instance was during the Falkland crisis when I had been invited to make, to give a speech for the a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Foreign Office. I had lunch with, at the Foreign Office during the Hague shuttle between Argentina and London, in which the various negotiating options for compromise were explained to me. I then called on Lady Thatcher for tea, and I began the conversation by asking her which of the compromises I had heard at lunch was favored by her. The word compromise set off such a storm of outrage that we never got to the topic because she made clear that whatever I might have heard elsewhere, there would be no compromise at 10 Downing Street. So her fortitude was remarkable. But over the years, I was moved and inspired by her courage, her loyalty, and uh, her constant commitment to the Atlantic relationship. Margaret Thatcher displayed these attributes articulately in the Findlay address at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. The site of Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech 50 years earlier. She put forward challenges which in their essence are even more urgent today. Should Russia be regarded as a potential threat or a partner? What should NATO's attitude be to out-of-area issues? Should NATO admit the new democracies of Central Europe? And should Europe develop its own defense identity in NATO? Two decades after Lady Thatcher's present address, the transatlantic world faces another set of a comparable nature. The world order the West created to end its 30 years war in 1648 was based on the notion of sovereignty of states secured by a balance of power between a multiplicity of entities. It now confronts concepts of order drawn from different historical and cultural experiences and involving visions of continental and universal religious dimensions. So the long-term issue becomes whether these issues are to be resolved by the maxims of the nation state or new, more globalized concepts, with what consequences for world order. Let me do so by adapting Lady Thatcher's challenges to some of our circumstances. First, Russia. The Russian challenge, Lady Thatcher's first question Today focuses on Ukraine and Syria, but it also reflects a deeper alienation. 
stretching with 11 time zones from Europe along the borders of Islam and to the Pacific. Russia has developed a distinct conception of world order. In its perennial quest for security, along vast boundaries with few natural demarcations, Russia has evolved what amounts to a definition of absolute security, which we wears on absolute insecurity for some of its neighbors. At the same time, Russia's geostrategic scale, its almost mystic conception of greatness, and the willingness of its people to endure hardship have helped over the centuries to preserve the global equ equilibrium against imperial designs by Mongols, Swedes, French, and German. The result for Russia has been ambivalence, a desire to be accepted by Europe and to transcend it simultaneously. The special sense of identity helps explain President Putin's statement that the demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest political catastrophe of the century. Putin's view of international politics is often described as a recurrence of 1930s European nationalist authoritarianism. More accurately, it is the heritage of the world view identified with the novelist Dostoevsky, as exemplified in his 1880 speech at the dedication of a monument to the poet Pushkin. Its passionate call for a new spirit of Russian greatness based on the spiritual qualities of the Russian character was taken up in the late 20th century even by the famous dissident and novelist Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Abandoning his exile in Vermont to return to Russia, Solzhenitsyn, in his book on the Russian question, called for action by the Russian leadership to save the Russian people who had been driven out of Russia. Putin, of course, has pursued the same theme. How then should the West develop relations with Russia, a country that is a vital element for European security? but which for reasons of history and geography has a fundamentally different view of what constitutes a mutually satisfactory arrangement in areas adjacent to Russia. It's the wisest cause to pressure Russia until it accepts Western views of its internal and global structure. Or starting from this premise, which has to precede any other action, a scope left for a political process that reduces or ends the mutual alienation in pursuit of an agreed concept of world order. Will the Russian border 
be forever a permanent zone of confrontation? Or can Western policy shape it into a zone of potential cooperation? And what are the criteria for such a process? These are the questions of European order that need systematic consideration. I want to repeat that either concept requires a Western defense capability which removes the temptation for military pressure. And I will return to this in theme in my closing remarks. Lady Thatcher's query regarding out-of-area issues concerns in our day primarily China and the Middle East. China has launched its Belt and Road Initiative as a grand design with political, economic, cultural and security implications ranging from the East China Sea in effect to the English Channel. It evokes memories of a lecture to the Royal Geographic Society in 1904 by Sir Harold Mackinder who designate, who described the European heartland as the geostrategic pivot of the globe. By seeking to connect China to Central Asia and eventually to Europe, the new Silk Road will in effect shift the world center of gravity from the Atlantic to the Eurasian landmass. The road traverses an immense diversity of human cultures, including great cultures like Russia, India, Iran, and Turkey, and of course, ultimately, Western Europe, each of which will have to decide if they will join it, cooperate with it, or oppose it in what terms and in what form. The complexities are staggering as they are compelling. The Belt and Road Initiative is being put forward in an international strategic environment that has been overwhelmingly defined by the West Westphalian notion of order. But China is unique, transcending the dimensions of the Westphalian state. It is at once an ancient civilization, a state, an empire, and a globalizing economy. Inevitably, the Belt and Road concept will is a quest for an international order compatible with the historical experience and strategic vision of historic China. This evolution will mark the third transformation of China in the last century. Ma brought unity, Deng brought reform, and now President Xi is seeking to fulfill what he calls the Chinese dream, going back to the late Qing reformers. When the People's Republic of China enters its second hundred years in 2049, it will be in Xi's definition be as powerful if not more powerful than any other society in the world and have the per capita GDP of fully 
developed countries. In the process, the United States and China will become the world's two most consequential countries, both economic and geopolitically, obliged to undertake unprecedented adaptations in their uh, traditional approach. Not since it became a global power after World War II has the United States had to contend with its geopolitical equal. And never in its millennia long history has China conceived of a foreign nation as more than a tributary to it, the central or uh, middle kingdom as the first British ambassador who was sent to China experienced and vividly described in his memoirs. And that happened in, 17, in the 1790s. <clears throat> Both countries think of themselves as exceptional, albeit in a fundamentally different way. America sees spreading its values and system to other countries as part of its mission. China in historically acted on the principle that the majesty of its performance would motivate other countries into hierarchy based on respect. In both countries, there exist many opinions about how to reconcile the differences of perspective. For both of them and the rest of the world, the, their F struggle for co-evolution or a form of confrontation will be the defining experience of the next period. What will be the role of Europe in such a world as part of the Atlantic world or an entity redefining itself autonomously? adjusting to the fluctuations surrounding it as a component of a transatlantic arrangement or as a differential entity whose elements participate in the historic balance of power model as individuals. As an admirer of Lady Thatcher, I favor, of course, the transatlantic model. Let me make a few observations about the Middle East. In Eurasia and along Russia's borders, world order is challenged by the consequences of consolidation. Around the periphery of the Middle East, it is threatened by the turmoil of dissolution. The Westphalian system of order that emerged at the end of the First World War is now in shambles. Four states in the region have ceased to function as sovereign. Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Yemen have become battlegrounds for factions seeking to impose their rule. Across large areas of, area of Iraq and Syria, an ideologically radical religious army, the, the Islamic State, has declared itself as a foe of modern civilization, seeking violently to replace the international system's multiplicity of states 
with a single Islamic empire, empire governed by Sharia law. Under these circumstances, the traditional adage that the enemy of your enemy can be regarded as your friend no longer fully applies. In the contemporary Middle East, the enemy of your enemy may also be your enemy. So, I will summarize my views because I want to make another point about NATO, uh, which is that a strategic conception of the outcome of the struggles that are now going on between the Western nations is absolutely essential. If it does, if it does not occur, uh, we will see a gradual spread of uh, uh, of chaos. Uh, the West must decide what outcome is compatible with its view of an emerging world order and how it, how it defines it. It cannot commit to a choice based on religious groupings in the abstract. Its support must aim for stability and against whatever grouping most threatens stability. If the West engages without a geostrategic concept, chaos will grow. If it withdraws in concept or in fact, as has been and remains, the temptation of some over the past decade, other great powers like China and India, which cannot afford chaos along their borders or turmoil within them, will gradually step in the west, into the West place together with Russia. The pattern of world politics of recent centuries will there be, by, be revolutionized. These trends involve two implications for the Atlantic Alliance. Insofar as upheavals on the various continents threaten the balance of power, they represent a threat to security. But they also challenge the West to contribute to the building of a new world order. Article 5 of the NATO Charter defends what must be preserved, defines what must be preserved, and it is essential for that purpose. But it cannot be the end and the principal definition of Atlantic policy. NATO was formed in 1949 to protect its members against assaults from a Russia that had, was assumed to have a conventional preponderance and was building its nuclear arsenal. But NATO has proved to be more precise in its original objectives than in its evolution. It is clearer about its defensive commitments than its role in contributing to world order. Conceived as a deterrent to a threatening Soviet Union, NATO 
has developed both a legal application and an expression of joint determination of the free nations of the West. A tradition of American leadership resulted because the American nuclear arsenal has been conceived as the ultimate counterweight to Soviet military power. As the decades went by, the alliance has turned increasingly into a unilateral American guarantee rather than an agreed strategic concept relevant to the evolving world. Lady Thatcher's concept of the Atlantic Alliance was very different from current realities. She de described it as, in essence, comprised of America as the dominant power, surrounded by allies which generally follow her lead. This is no longer fully the case. The United States is not always leading in the Thatcher mode, and the, mi the mindset of some Europeans is to explore alternatives. The realities of population, resources and technology, and capital assure a decisive global role for an involved America and a strategically engaged Europe. It will, however, not come automatically nor by proclamation. In today's rapidly changing world, NATO must examine in a permanent re-examination of its goals and capabilities. The shift in the structures that comprise the contemporary world order should impel NATO and its members to ask themselves questions as these. What changes other than the control of the territory of its members will it seek to prevent? And by what means? What are the political goals and what are the means it will assemble for them? So let me conclude by repeating the challenge laid down by Lady Thatcher in her Findlay lecture. What is to be done? I believe that what is now required is a new and imaginative Atlantic initiative. Its purpose must be to redefine Atlanticism in the light of the challenges I have been describing. There are rare moments in history when history is open and its course changed by new means. We may be at just such a moment today, right now. Lady Thatcher's quote reflected, above all, an exhortation and a definition of a task. The exhortation is still valid because we're at an even more fraught juncture today. Thank you very much. Dr. Kishner, thank you very much indeed. Um, I believe I would express the consensus of the audience if I say um, we were a little bit late starting, so I'm going to take the liberty of going uh, about five minutes over to leave ourselves some time for ten minutes of questions with Dr. Kishner. I'm sure the audience here would, would all want that. We've had questions submitted via Twitter, uh, which have been sent to me. I've been looking through them and curating some of them to put themes together. And one theme that comes out in two or three of the questions, um, Dr. Kissinger, is this, this question of China. 
I mean, you, you yourself have said that we, that if there is to be a new world order, a, a new global order, it has to be based not just on a Western accommodation with China, but a partnership between the United States and China, something that goes further than even you created in the early 1970s with Richard Nixon. And some of the questions have reflected the, the problem of North Korea in that respect. Could the North Korea crisis be a focus for a much different relationship between America and China for the future? Well, the relationship it, to which I contributed uh, decades, some decades ago was an aspect of the conduct of the Cold War. It was a way to balance Russia and China and its strategic aim at that time was to put the United States into a position where it had better relations with either of them than they had with each other, thereby preventing a coordinated onslaught on the West. The world has evolved in major ways since then because we now have a China uh, with a globalizing economy and an imminent capacity of a degree of equality in strategic impact with the United States. So we really have two options before us. One, a repetition on a global scale of the sort of policy that preceded World War I in which nations are in constant contact with each other and suffering or experiencing the impact of other nations repeat tensions and reconciliations up to a point where one of them gets out of control or to explore without assurance that it will succeed uh, the possibility of what one could call co-evolution, that both cultures evolve in uh, an organic way, uh, but are conscious of the need that not only conflict has to be avoided, but some larger reconciliation of the definitions of objectives is at least attempted. We are now in the foothills of such an exploration, which is handicapped by the big cultural differences between the American perception of policy and the Chinese perception of policy. The American perception of policy is that the natural order of the world is stable and that therefore the task of foreign policy is to fix whatever problems arise after which things will return to normalcy. The Chinese perception is that every solution is not an end of a problem but the beginning of another problem and that therefore uh, one has to conduct policy in terms of longer term concepts. Now, whether these views find a reconciliation uh, remains to be seen. But I believe that the need for it is widely understood and is seriously thought about, and that to let matters drift into resolution by crisis runs the risk of so many divergences accumulating over a period of time that some catastrophic outcome uh, is ahead of us. So this is uh, my basic historic view of this process 
uh, I think that the need for it is understood by some Chinese leaders and also on the American side. All the big gaps have to be filled and the role of Europe has its own challenge mm. as I try to sketch in my remarks. Um, thank you. We, we've had two or three questions that you'll not be surprised to hear about Brexit. And really they come down to, uh, to summarize, where will Brexit leave the United Kingdom in relation to the United States, do you feel, in the next, say, five to 10 years? Is there a danger that, we leave, that Brexit will leave Britain actually isolated in some way or in a better position to have influence in the Western alliance and Western thinking? In my own thinking, when the issue first came up, I was automatically in favor of Remain because that was what we were all familiar with. As the debate evolved, I began to think of the need that I believe exists for a more, a new articulation of the Atlantic Partnership. Not because the importance of the Atlantic Partnership has diminished uh, quite the country, but because the conditions in which it has to be applied are now more widespread. And in that redefinition, I thought that a Britain returning to some of its historic contributions of uh, bridging the Atlantic and as a security leader of the Western world might under Brexit play an even more distinctive role if it conceived its role that way. And I still hope that as these negotiations develop that uh, Britain will be able to continue what was its historic role in forming the Atlantic Partnership in the 40s from precisely that point of view, which means that if even some links to Europe are being severed, uh, other links will be built with the United States and both of these links will contribute to Europe and Britain will not leave Europe completely, but contribute to the Atlantic uh, partnership in a way that is more relevant to the, uh, to the emerging world. So I look at this issue, not primarily or exclusively from the economic point of view, but from the point of view of the strategies that need to emerge. And in that, especially, I think a new perception of the Atlantic Partnership is necessary and Britain could play a distinctive role. Thank you. Final question. We've had a number of questions submitted about cyber uh, aspects of world politics and social media and so on. And, um, you wrote yourself in, the, in your book on world order that international consensus seems now to be more a matter of emotional consensus than a consensus over facts sometimes. Simple question in a way is, do you think that the world of social media, the interconnected world of the internet, is that changing the nature of world order or is it just another aspect in which traditional methods have got to be adjusted? Is there something really conceptually new about a world of social media that connects so many people uh, within populations? Uh, you should judge my answer to this question by the fact that my grandchildren are embarrassed by my ignorance 
of the technical aspects <laughs> of, of the cyber world. All of us. Uh, so I speak as an observer. I think the cyber world is changing in a significant way. The nature of, of the human character. When one learns from books, one has and it's not an argument for abolishing the cyber world. It's an argument for understanding its consequences. When one learns from books, one cannot possibly remember everything that one has read. And therefore, one has to formulate it into concepts which establish the comparability of events and project them into a future. When one lives in a world in which one can acquire information by pushing, pushing a button, there is no need for sequential thinking because one always has the option of, uh, uh, of uh, pushing the button. Uh, in a world that in its structure imposes a certain reflectiveness, one can rely on the amount of time that in the best practice leads to reflectiveness. But in a world in which everything is instantaneous, there is a danger of narcissism and emotionality and of leadership that focuses on the immediate impact and has very few incentives for long-range considerations and maybe not enough of an audience for long-range considerations. And if you add to it the implications of artificial intelligence in which from one can think about machines that can teach themselves and communicate with each other, whether a point will be reached where human beings become like Incas vis-a-vis -vis their Spanish machines. Uh, these are reflections about the future. And so we need philosophy of cyber in which the scientists are so far ahead of the political thinkers and in the process multiply the impact of these events. Uh, I consider this one of the fundamental challenges of our period, which we are not yet beginning to master. Dr. Kissinger, thank you. Very reluctantly, um, we're going to move on now. The, you've set us up beautifully for the next session, which Charles Moore will be chairing on values. Um, and Dr. Kissinger has a number of appointments in London today, not least with our own Prime Minister, and will be with us again this evening for the dinner. It'd be wonderful to um, have him back here. But it's often said that as ideas get older, they suffer from a hardening of the categories. Um, I don't know what's happening to your arteries, Dr. Kissinger, but your categories...